Uh, I would like to start our uh, presentation today, and I'm so happy and privileged and so grateful to uh, Lieutenant Colonel Reserve Yal Dror, uh, the founder and uh, the commander of the Good Neighbor Project. And in a minute, he will start telling us about this project. I'm also very happy to have uh, Dr. Harari here. Uh, Dr. Harari is a senior pediatrician who was in charge of uh, receiving the uh, Syrian children on behalf of uh, the uh, Rif Kazim Hospital in Sfat. Uh, we know each other for uh, quite a few years and he's an amazing person, an amazing uh, pediatrician. And uh, we might have a special guest today. I'm not yet sure about it. Uh, Dr. Lieutenant Colonel uh, Sergei Putikov, who was in charge of the medical part of the Good Neighbor Project. Um, so I hope he will be able to join us uh, later. So right now- Julie, um, I think I saw him. I think I saw him on. Oh, I'm here. I'm here. Yeah, he's here. Okay, so uh, yeah, now I can see you. Okay, so yeah, Kutikov, uh, Dr. Kutikov, Hello. thank you for joining us. This is wonderful to have you here, and thank uh, to Ayal who invited uh, Dr. Sergei. So let's start from the beginning. That's all I had to say. Thank you again for joining us, and uh, Ayal, it's all yours. So good evening. Thank you very much for coming here, hearing me and my friends speaking. Uh, I'm very thrilled to be here and speci especially in those days when the name Israel is not such a good news, unfortunately, for a lot of people around the world. It's so warming the heart being in Israel and know that uh, 5,000 miles from here we have so many friends. So for me it's a pleasure and a privilege to speak with people like you as volunteering, living their ordinary life and come to help the IDF. Uh, I'm so happy that I have here three friends. Uh, first of all, Dr. Michael Arari, which uh, will, when I will finish talking, he will uh, speak a little bit about his point of view about this operation. My friend, my personal doctor, my deputy uh, in the last uh, two years, of the operation, Dr. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Sergei Katikov. It's a pleasure always to see you. Uh, we had two and a half years, 24 seven. I'm, I spoke with him more than with my, my wife and I'm so grateful that you, you are here with us. And there is another friend here, Lieutenant Colonel Shai Shul. Uh, very good friend, a Hello. man with so much knowledge you, about you. what Israel did in the humanitarian field across the world. And his personal close friend for me is now serving in the IDF in the state. Uh, and thank you, Shai, for being here. I will show with you my presentation and we'll start talking a little bit about the biggest humanitarian operation led ever by the IDF. I think it might be one of the biggest operation, military operation led by any army uh, in the world uh, ever. Um, just a second, let's roll, great. So a minute about myself, as mentioned, my name is Eyal Dro. I'm a Lieutenant Colonel by my military rank served the IDF, served my country in the last 24 years, uh, retired two years ago and still continue serving as a reserve officer. I'm married to my lovely wife, Michal, and have three children. And I'm living in a, a small kibbutz uh, in the northern part of Israel, Nehemia. The pictures you can see is from my balcony, Mount Hermon in the river. And since the day I retired, basically I'm doing four main things. First of all, and the most important is functioning as a father and husband. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the fact, but when you are serving so many years in the IDF, especially in front in the frontline units, uh, you don't have your own time, and not holidays, vacations, weekends, etc. When the IDF called. Uh, you are going to the mission, and now I have finally the time to make uh, the breakfast for my children before going to school and to make my coffee to, to my wife. So 
I'm really enjoying this life, but I'm doing also three main things, very important things in my uh, eyes. Speaking, the first one is speaking, meeting with people uh, here in Israel and before COVID uh, around the world, sharing with them the message of the Good Neighbor Project. I'm a student, I'm writing my PhD on the University of Haifa. And recently I finished writing my, the first version of the book about the Good Neighbor Project. I think that this is more than enough about myself. Let's start. So I think that if I had just one minute to show with you the meaning of Operation Good Neighbor, probably I would have used this slide. It is written here in Arabic, and I will read it in Arabic so you will be you will understand uh, that my second language is Arabic. This is my excuse for not speaking English so polite, but let's try it in Arabic. It's written here, Shukran Israel al Musada wal Hub. It means thank you, Israel, for the help and for the love. A picture drawn by a Syrian child dedicated to the state of Israel, something that was behind of an imagination a couple of years ago and become reasonable thanks to Operation Good Neighbor. And we will speak about this operation. I will start step by step from a short introduction. I'm sure that all of you are familiar with the map, the neighborhood of the Middle East, the state of Israel, its neighbors, the state of Syria, and where is the blue spot, the Golan Heights, the area that our story happened. Uh, and it all, all, oh, 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 everything began in Syria because of the Arab Spring. The Arab Spring began in Africa, in Tunisia, Algeria. Some of you have maybe heard about Gaddafi from Libya, Mubarak from Egypt. It hit Syria in March 2011. Uh, civilians would demonstrate against their corrupted regime, the Assad, who uh, uh, in a democratic way, just three years ago, has been elected again. So it was so democratically that he won 95% of the voices of the Syrians. And back in 2013, the people started to protest against him. Unfortunately for the Syrian, very quickly it began, it became one of the most tragic events the world experienced in the last decades, a tragic civil war in which over than 1 million people lost their lives. You can see the damage to the infrastructure, 6 million refugees, Basically, I can tell you that this country has been destroyed and it will never be again Syria that has been before 2011. But it happened in Syria. How it is connected to the state of Israel? Well, this was our border in the last 40 years, between 73 until 2011. Very quiet border. You can see that there isn't almost a fence between us. It is not because the Syrians uh, made peace with Israel. There isn't any peace agreement. We have a ceasefire agreement signed in 74. However, because Israel is very close to the uh, Syrian capital, Damascus, they preferred not to uh, target Israel from that border, but everything has been changed because of that civil war. Pay, please pay, pay attention to this map. I will draw here the line, the blue line, the border between Israel to Syria. Person that has been visit the Golan Heights for sure has come to this area, Mount Bental, the high mountain which observed to Syria. It is approximately here. Here is Mount Hermon, the highest place in Israel, a piece of Lebanon. In the south we have a piece of Jordan. But take a look please about those colors. Until 2011, we had a Syrian army who controlled the border. Because of the civil war, some of those soldiers, Syrian soldiers, had to withdraw from the area. And the regime was here in the red spot. But when we were speaking about Syrian regime since 2014, we we're speaking about Hezbollah and Iran. We had on the southern part, in the black area, we had ISIS. And on the green area, which was controlled by rebels, people with weapons who fought against the regime. We had some extremist groups, like for example, if I will say Jabhat al-Nusra, I don't know how many uh, from you will raise their hands and understand 
who are the Chabat and Nusra, but if I will say Al Qaeda, all of you will understand. So some of our bitter enemies were located on this border, but we are not here to speak about military solution. I'm going to speak with you about human beings. I'm going to speak with you about civilians, 250,000 civilians living in the green area, people whose all of their infrastructure has been destroyed by the regime, by their own regime. People were living without electricity, without water, without hospitals, without schools, everything has been bombed. You can see with those pictures, by these pictures, people were living in a tent and this is a temporary hospital in which you can see an emergency room. You can assume what is the chance of a person needed a, a life-saving treatment reaching this temporary emergency room. He wouldn't have been survived. Last thing about the Syrians, well, they were educated to hate the state of Israel. This is something that we heard from hundreds of Syrian mothers who met us in Israel. They've been told us that Israel is the enemy. This is what the regime for centuries uh, told them uh, and they were afraid from us. But because of their uh, bad situation, their poor humanitarian situation in 2013, some people reached the border fence and asked for help. They were wounded and they asked for help from the IDF soldiers. When we are speaking about IDF soldiers, I'm not speaking about commanders in my age. I'm speaking about 19, 20 years old soldiers who protected our border. They saw those wounded people and asked their commanders the permission to open the border. Literally, we can say to open their heart for those people without knowing if they are going to attack them. But they asked for help and our soldiers, fine soldiers, decided to help them. We opened the border fence at that night. And since then, for six years, we let over than 4,500 people to get to the state of Israel, to enter the state of Israel, to get and getting a life saving treatment. Now, we have been accused that we are treating Hezbollah, Al Qaeda, ISIS. It's a crap, sorry for the word. We gave life saving treatment to human beings. I can show you this boy, he was 14 years old. It was one of my terrible most terrible nights because he reached with his entire family the border fence. The home suffered from direct target. It was the, the, the target by the regime. The family was almost burned to death. We had to call in a helicopter in order to evacuate it to one of the Tel Aviv hospitals to save his, its life. And for three years, it was confidential operation until in 2016, the Syrians asked for more help from the IDF, and the IDF decided to establish a unit, the Good Neighbor Unit. Uh, I was chosen, and I was privileged to be chosen to be its commander. My role was to think 24-7 about the enemy, or I will rephrase it, to think 24-7 about people, human beings living in an enemy country. And with your permission, I will take you immediately with me to the border fence to show with you some of these hopes. The first one, and the most emotional by far from these operations, we call the doctor's visit. The name is not metal, the purpose it is. Every week, in winter time, in summer time, when it was fog, when it was rain, when it was snow, every week, Dr. Sergei, my soldiers, and I met 25 children accompanied with their mothers. Those children weren't wounded from the war. Those children suffered from chronic diseases like diabetes, ill problem, urologic problem, orthopedic problem. Anything that in our normal world you need to go to an expert doctor and you can, can continue with your life. In Syria, you don't have any experts, doctors at that time. We opened the border fence, but I wanna take 30 seconds about this picture because it is not pastoralic like it seems to be. I remind you that this area was controlled by ISIS. 
by Al Qaeda and by Hezbollah. None of them voted for peace no prior for peace Nobel for the state of Israel. They do not like Israelis. They declared that the mission is to destroy the state of Israel, and they were on the other side of the fence. The meaning for us as a soldier, every time that we open the border fence for those children, we risk our life. We chose to risk our lives in order to save others, even if they are living in an enemy country. It was very dangerous procedure meeting them on the border fence, but we had a mission. The mission was to bring them to the expert doctors that will be able to treat them and to give them the opportunity to continue with their normal lives. I told you it was the most emotional operation because being with those children, we've been exposed to their stories. I will show just two. There is hundreds of them. I used to play football with one of the children. We had all day long to spend with the children. So you can see that we gave them papers to draw. We sang with them. I love to play football, soccer. So I play with one of them and he fall down. He was running and he fall down on the earth. I know as a father of three children that when a child is getting hurt, he started to cry. This boy wasn't crying. So I reached to his mother and I asked her why the boy is not crying. What she answered me was shocking. She told me he's not crying because he knows that nobody cares. He's not crying because he knows that nobody cares. And I sat with this boy, he was 10 years old. I spoke with him Arabic, of course, and I asked him a very simple question. I asked him, when you will be adult, what do you want to do with your life? My big, biggest daughter, she is now 10 years old. When I ask her this question, she's changing her mind. Sometimes she want to be a famous lawyer. Sometimes she want to be a doctor. Sometimes she want to be a dancer. Personally, I would prefer that she will be a famous officer in the IDF, but this is something that I had to negotiate with her mom. But she knows what she want to do. I don't know if she will do so. But this boy wasn't response. And I asked him again, and just on the third time he told me with his sad look on his eyes, I will not be an adult. Probably I will die in a year or two. Can you imagine yourself, children who do not cry because nobody cares and cannot see their future? This was the Syrian children's world. And we were privileged to help them. We were privileged to make them smile. Doctor's visit operation, we got 1,400 smiles from 1,400 Syrian children who entered Israel and been treated in Ziv Hospital with Dr. Michael, in Poria Hospital in Tiberia, and in the Galil Hospital in Aharia. 1,400 children that came back to Syria after a couple of hours and showed that Israel is not an enemy, showed that Israel, Israelis, and you know, when we're speaking about Israelis, we are not speaking about Jews, we are speaking about people living in Israel, in the hospitals, we have Jews, we have Muslims, we have Christians, we have all kinds of society of Israel. And they show that Israel is not the enemy. And when the operation continued, we had to collaborate with some NGOs, non-government organizational. One of them was the Friendships Unlimited Americans, Christian, living in Louisiana. They love the state of Israel and they decided to cooperate with us and they build this huge field clinic behind the fence, by the way, in the DMZ. This clinic was just a daycare clinic. A doctor, a nurse can give you the antibiotics. In Syria, you don't have any antibiotics. Doing an ultrasound. The most basic things 
that all of us have just across our street. In Syria, I don't have 8,000 people enter this clinic. But I think that the most important thing was not the health treatment, was the psychological treatment. The staff built this huge playground and the children could have played. The children could have ate ice cream. Can you imagine your world without ice cream? I cannot. This girl, it was the first time in her life eating an ice cream. How do I know it? Because when you don't have any electricity, you can't have ice cream. This boy, it was the first time playing with such a huge teddy bear. How do I know it? Because he told me. 8,000 Syrians were treated in this clinic and came back to Syria and sure that Israel is not the enemy anymore. But the operation wasn't just on the medic, on the health section. Yeah, we built a maternity hospital in which 1,000 babies, Syrian babies were born in one of the villages. We sent teams of foreign doctors to treat uh, the Syrians and we support clinics with hundreds of tons of medicines and equipment, but it wasn't just this. We support them, for example, also with clothes. In winter time, in the Golan Heights, it's freezing. When you are living in a tent without any heat warmer, a dry coat will literally save your life. 350 tons of coats were delivered to the Syrian side. And we send them hundreds of tons of food from flour to meat, all kinds of food, diesel fuel, all the basic needs for people to survive the inferno that they were, they were living. Almost three years, 700 humanitarian operations, 700 nights that we weren't sleeping. 700 nights we weren't with our families 700 life we chose to protect the state of israel by helping human beings living in an enemy country and in the summer of 2018 after 700 humanitarian operation after hundreds of thousands of tons of equipment from all kinds delivered to the Syrian side, after over 6,000 Syrians treated in Israel, in addition to 8,000 treated in the field clinic with, that we just spoke, the Syrian army with the Russians start to bomb the area of Kenetra and Dara. This is the two areas located next to the Israeli border. Six weeks of heavy bombing. The Syrian side knew that it's like game over. They will not be able to fight again. They will have to surrender. But we had the time for last one operation. The most famous operation of, of Operation Good Neighbor was the rescue of the white helmets. The white helmets, Syrian people that mission war to save Syrian lives all over Syria. They were the first to reach the places the regime bombed. They were the first to expose the word that Assad is using gas. If you remember the, if you remember the red lines of President Obama back at 2014, they were the first to expose that the Syrian regime is committed crimes against humanity. And they were condemned to death because of that. It was an international operation. Our prime minister got requests from his colleagues who support those people. And we decided to open the border fence for a whole night. An ordinary operation continues between 25 to 60 minutes. It's a huge risk. Every minute that the border is open, open is a huge risk. We try to minimize the minutes the border were open. Here, we opened it for a whole night, 10 hours. We could have seen the bullets in the sky. We heard the clashes between the Syrian army and the rest of the rebels. 
but we opened a border fence for over than 400 people, entire families, men and women, children and babies, crossed at that night the border. For me, as a person who was responsible of the coordination with the Syrian side in this operation, it was amazing to stand just here with my friend, to see the border fence and to see the Syrians on the other side, gripping of fear, crossing to Israel, that country that just a couple of years ago was the, the enemy, smiling, understanding that their life has been saved. Now they are not in Israel. The operation, the international coordination was agreed that we will rescue them from Syria. And we took them by buses to the Israeli Jordanian border. They crossed the border to Jordan. And there, the countries that support them gave them, gave them new, new identities, new lives. They are now living even in the state. But those people will not forget that in the last, you know, Israel saved their lives. And the operation came to an end. And I will finish with one last slide. Because people ask me, was it worth it? Was it worth to risk your lives? Was it worth to risk Dr. Sergei's lives and his soldiers' lives? Was it worth, worth to spend so, many, so much money and resources about this operation? What I claim, loud and clear, for sure. We are Jewish. We are Jews. We were on the Holocaust time, nobody stand with us. For me, as a person born and raised in Israel, as an officer in the IDF, it's a privilege to be able to help other people and it doesn't matter at all if they are Syrians or Egyptians or Albanians. It doesn't matter at all. This is the right thing to do. But I think that the biggest achievement of Operation Good Neighbor, you can understand it by this picture, the flag of Israel. But the story behind it is even more interesting. A nine years old girl named Wiham crossed the border suffering from severe diabetes. The Israeli doctors claimed that 24 hours later she wouldn't have survived. She was treated here a couple of months. And just before she go back to Syria, she drew the flag of Israel. She wrote here her name, Wiham. This is not, by the way, this is not how you spell your Arabic name, Wiham. You don't write it like this. But when you are a nine years old girl and you didn't learn one day in school, it is acceptable that you will make mistake even with your name. And the international sign of love. And then she wrote here, Abu Yaqub, the father of Jacob. But it wasn't because she was a religious girl. Ladies and gentlemen, Abu Yaqub was my Syrian name. This is how the Syrian knew me. So the flag of Israel drew by a Syrian child Syrian girl who dedicated to an IDF officer who saved her life. This is the story of the good neighbor. This what will continue for years to come. We will not forget the state of Israel. The people of the white helmets will not forget the, the state of Israel. The children that were treated in Israel, the people that Israel saved their lives and support them in these six years will not forget the state of Israel. And I think that this is the biggest achievement of Operation Good Neighbor. And with this word, I just can say thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to share with them, with you, the story. Thank you very much. I will stop sharing my screen and I will give the opportunity to Dr. Michael to speak some more. Thank you so much. Yale, thank you very much. It was uh, it was uh, difficult and amazing and moving and all in the same time. 
So thank you for for telling us this story. And um, and uh, yes, we are Jewish, and uh, we are happy that you made us proud. So uh, Dr. Rari, uh, Michael, we are looking forward to listening to you now. Uh, thanks, uh, Julia. Now I'm screen sharing, but I can't see. Oh, I've got to open my screen. So stop share. Hold on one sec. I'm technologically challenged, I think. Um, zoom. Can you see me? We see you, but not your screen. Hmm. We saw your screen for a minute before. You're on stop video, I think. See, I'm sorry. Oh, there we go. All right. Now I have to do share screen again. Let's hope it works. Now we're right. All right. Can you see my screen okay. now? Yes, we can see your screen. And now you have to be on the presentation mode. Yes, that's it. So my name is Michael Bradley. Let me thank you all for giving me an opportunity to speak to you. Thank you, Julia, who's a friend and was my teacher when I learned to be a tour guide um, two years ago. And they are and Sergei, who I, um, I've had much to do with over the last seven or so years. I'll briefly introduce myself. I'm an Australian paediatrician originally. Um, my grandparents are from Syria, as it happens. I live in the far north of Israel, so I almost feel like I've come completed a very big circle. I lived and worked for many years in the Papua New Guinea Highlands and in the UK, um, but most of my training and upbringing has been in Melbourne at the Royal Children's Hospital. Um, but 10 years ago, I came to this place, which is the Ziv Medical Center in the Upper Galilee. And uh, Eyal has orientated us, um, but Tzfat, which is the hospital in which I work, is here in the Galilee Panhandle, or Etzvah Galil. And just to the east of Tzfat is the Golan Heights. And just a little bit beyond that is Syria, which is surprisingly close, and Lebanon, which is even closer. And Quneitra province is one of the rebel provinces was here, and Dara province sort of extends further east. Um, the hospital in which I work as a senior pediatrician is a university hospital. And we generally, before the Syrian civil war, at least we serviced about 300,000 residents of the Upper Galilee and Golan Heights. Um, I think it's worth pausing for a second before we get back into the series just to tell you a bit about our hospital. The Upper Galilee has a population that is roughly a third Druze, a third Arabs and a third Jews. Um, in our hospital, the head of our hospital is a Druze, the deputy head of our hospital is an Arab, the heads of departments are roughly a third, a third, a third Druze, Arabs and Jews. Cleaning staff are roughly a third Druze, a third Arabs, a third Druze, Jews. The, the population mix is roughly the same. And in a state that's repeatedly accused of being an apartheid state, um, I find that astonishingly egalitarian, far more than anything I've worked in in Australia or in the UK. And if this is what apartheid looks like, we'll bring it on. Um, and the Syrian civil war started in March 2011. And if we jump two years ahead, um, it became apparent, especially to those of us living in the north, that there was carnage happening on the other side because you could hear it on a daily basis, the tympanic sounds of shell fire and bombs being dropped. And the United Nations initially updated us on the carnage across the border. But um, some two years after the outbreak of the civil war, it became too dangerous for the United Nations and other international observers to stay in Syria. So really everything we know about Syria from 2013 onwards comes from the Syrian Observatory from Human Rights, which is based in London, not in Syria. But there are various estimates about how many people okay, die and, the, and the, the statistics are of necessity um, um, controversial, but about half a million to one, pe one million people died, about 1.7 million people were injured. But more importantly, for our immediate purposes of our talk, the medical infrastructure in Syria was decimated. And even if it was 
um, at least partially intact in the main centres, the rebel provinces, especially Cronetra and Dera that we, we pointed out earlier, they had no inf medical infrastructure intact whatsoever and it was terribly dangerous for anyone from the rebel provinces to make their way to Damascus or other major centres because they would be arrested, tortured, interrogated and killed. And so for the first couple of years, Israel understandably did nothing because it wasn't uh, in their power to do anything. Um, and it was um, very painful, I think, to be a resident in Israel and watch this happening just across the border. And it was almost with relief that on the 16th of February, um, those of us who were involved in the mass trauma response at Ziv Hospital in Tzfat, we got a page saying this is not a drill coming to the hospital now. And uh, that night, seven Syrians were brought to our hospital. And we were told it was going to be a one-off event. But really, from that day onwards, for another five and a half years, we had a steady trickle of patients coming from across the border. The Ziv Hospital took about uh, 1,300 patients um, over those five years. They had an average inpatient stay of about 18 days. Normally, the average inpatient stay at Ziv Hospital is about 2.1 days, so they stayed for much, much longer on average. About 17% of those were children. And nearly everyone who came to Ziv Hospital and to the other hospitals in the north suffered from blast injuries or high energy injuries. And in sort of a medical jargon, they're called complex multi-system injuries, meaning depending on how close you are to the blast, you know, it's, it's unlikely you're going to have just a broken arm or a broken leg or a, a scratch or here. It's likely that all your body is going to be uh, penetrated by shrapnel, of course, depending on how close you are to the blast. If you have multi-system injuries, then it means you're going to have many visits to an operating theater because you deal with the life-threatening things first and then you subsequently bring people back to operating theaters serially over time. But just to illustrate how difficult they were to manage, um, the Australian ambassador to Israel in July 2013 came to see the Syrians and he did a head count and found that the Syrians in our hospital amounted to just under 5% of the number of people who were admitted, um, but they took up just over 50% of our intensive care unit beds because they had prolonged in, inpatient stays and they were very, very complicated and they used up a huge, they were a huge drain on our resources, especially nursing time. Nurses had to routinely for, for several years double shift and sometimes triple do triple shifts. Uh, we took in about 180 children to our paediatric ward. As mentioned, most of them had multi-system injuries that came from being close to blasts. About 12 had at least one limb amputated. Five came with no accompanying family. Eight were covered or accompanied by a severely wounded family member. And this ordeal was a very intense and intensive experience. And we learned I think many, many lessons from them. And because time is short, I'll just share some of them with you, perhaps to illustrate what it was like for us and for the Syrians. It pains me as a physician to have to praise orthopedic surgeons, but um, here I'm going to do it in, in public. We had an orthopedic team that was determined to save limbs. Now, what do I mean? I'm going to have to get slightly medical in order to explain the significance of what we all saw. There's a condition, if you like, called an incomplete amputation. And the treatment for an incomplete amputation is to complete the amputation, to remove uh, the limb. But the orthopedic team decided that they were not going to amputate on anyone. You can always amputate sometime down the track, but they were going to try and salvage, save limbs rather than amputate them. I'm going to show you a slide, only one, which is gory and it's difficult to watch and it will make you feel unwell. And I'll put the slide on for about three or four seconds and then take it off. So if anyone's feeling squeamish or doesn't want to watch, please turn away. I'm going to put it on now. Um, this is an incomplete amputation of an eight-year-old girl. 
and this is what it looked like um, several weeks later. The incomplete amputation means that the wound is open, the bones are all broken, the limb is sort of hanging or dangling, and that there's been a compromise of the nerve and blood supply to the limb. And so the orthopedic surgeons used a technique which only was known in the Western world in the 1990s, but it was pioneered in Russia by a man called Ilizarov in the 1950s. And his work was first translated into English and brought into the United States in the 1990s. And it's still regarded as being sort of, it's still finding its place in, in Western medicine. But Ilizarov had a very important idea which we implemented time and time and time again with the Syrians, which is why I'm dwelling on it somewhat. He notion, his notion was as follows. If you have a broken bone that's at an angle and the limb is compromised, then by right you should amputate it. That's the, to finish the incomplete amputation. He said if you do what orthopedic surgeons do, which is to straighten the bone, in straightening the bone, you further damage blood vessels and nerves that are already compromised. So his revolutionary idea was if a limb is threatened with amputation and it's shaped like this, then you leave it like this. You don't straighten it, which is what orthopedic surgeons do. You leave it crooked for some time to allow some of the bone to heal, to allow some of the blood vessels and nerves to heal. And only then, after a few days or a few weeks, you start straightening it. And so he developed a series of splints to leave the crooked bone crooked, as it were, not to get it any worse, but not to get it any better. And then slowly over time, painfully over time, over many weeks and sometimes many months, you sort of uh, wiggle these ratchets or bolts and you gradually, gradually, gradually straighten the limb by fractions of a millimeter sometimes at a time. And so what I showed you in the previous picture ends up looking like this, and then some nine or 10 weeks later ends up looking like this. So this is the same girl in all three pictures. And she walked again and came back once for a review without her splint. And so this girl who by right should have lost her limb had her limb saved. And she's one story that's perhaps uh, symbolic or emblematic of many, many, many similar stories. The second lesson we learned was to avoid pain at all costs. I'd seen as an intensive care doctor and someone who'd worked in the third world for many years, I'd seen much trauma and illness, um, death. Um, nothing prepared me for war, war injuries and the psychological implications on the child of having had war injuries. But it became apparent, it took us a while to realize that if you have psychological trauma and you leave the child in any sort of physical pain, then you can't heal the psychological trauma until you first fix up the physical pain. So um, my role rapidly became to give anesthetics to children for often very simple things like changing dressings so as not to further inflict any physical pain on a child who is already psychological, psychologically traumatized. Perhaps lesson number three, perhaps would be number one really, is the use of distraction. Now, I think many of you have heard of Patch Adams, who is a, a famous clown, I think, popularized in the United States, popularized by Robin Williams in an eponymously named film. Um, I come from Australia, where we think we pioneered the use of clowns. Um, Nonetheless, I'd never ever seen clowns used as effectively as I did with the Syrians. What we did was we got the clowns to come into our morning handover meeting and they would hear what we were about to do to the child on any given day. They would then bounce out of the morning handover and start barking orders at the doctors in their clowny sort of fashion. And so the child who was about to have whatever it is that was being done to them that day would see the clown barking orders and snapping fingers and having us jump too. And many children, especially those about seven or eight years, finish their eight or nine or 10 weeks of admission with us, firmly believing that it was the clowns that were running the show rather than us running the show. And if you're fearful and traumatized and you somehow believe that there's a clown that's absolutely lovable, that's actually running things, it's a, not only a distraction, it's a method of healing. We also had play therapists, and as Ayala alluded to, most children had never seen a toy. 
is one of the clowns, uh, Johnny, who was the main clown that we used repeatedly for most of our Syrian children. He's a Greek Orthodox Arab from Nazareth. And the last lesson, I think, was to normalize the lives of these children as much as possible. Eyal touched on um, schooling. None of the Syrian children who came to us had been to school since the outbreak of the civil war. That is, since 2000, March 2011, not only was the medical infrastructure decimated, the, the education infrastructure was decimated, and there wasn't a single child who, who had been to school, who had learned formally to read. And we have a classroom in our, in our ward, and I'm a little bit ashamed when I think about my own attitude to going to school. I'm a bit ashamed when I saw, when I see, when I saw at least the, the, the thirst, the hunger that they had for, for schooling. It was really something to behold. And I'm sure it serves an enormous therapeutic function in getting the child back to a normal psychological uh, state. Um, perhaps uh, another aspect of normalizing the child was what to do with parents who were also injured, who came with the child. We did a terrible thing unwittingly at first. The, the eight-year-old girl who you saw with the bones hanging out and distracted everywhere, um, she was mute and she would not come out, come out from under her blanket and would not eat for several days um, until the penny dropped, until we realized that the child's mother, who was also severely injured, was in a different ward. So the child was in the children's ward and the mother was in the orthopedic ward. And clearly you can't heal, certainly not psychologically, but probably not even physically, when you've got this degree of anxiety and fear around you. And we were surprisingly slow, I think, to realize that to hell with where you nurse the parent and where you, use the where you nurse the child. So long as they're together, that's what's important. That's what's important. So we eventually realized that you have to put mother and child together, which may seem obvious in retrospect, but at the time it seemed most unusual. So he brought a very injured mother into the children's ward so that she could lie in the bed adjacent to that of her child. I leave you with a slide that I've actually used on a couple of occasions. Um, how, does it, how did it feel? It was appalling. As I said, I'd never, despite being, in a sense, illness and disease hardened, I'd never, and hardened to all sorts of trauma. I'd never seen war trauma, and I never wished to again. There was something um, that was far worse than anything I'd ever seen, and perhaps it was because there was the implicit realization that humans had deliberately inflicted this on one another, which made it much, much harder, I think, than road accidents or any other accidents or any other act of God. On the other hand, there was something ordinary about it. In Israel, as anyone who's worked in the health system knows, it's a very egalitarian system and Jews, Arabs, Christians, Muslims, we all work together and whatever differences there may be are virtually always left outside the medical institution. So therefore, we are often dealing with Arabs, with victims of terrorism, with terrorists themselves. And so the, initially, we didn't realize there was anything out of the ordinary about all of this. But in the end, I think we all felt exhilarated. You know, Israel is a very small place and often quite claustrophobic and surrounded by um, a hermetically sealed border. And just for a brief instant in our long history, a you know, brief instant in the, the, since 1948, these hermetically sealed borders opened up and became semi-permeable, semi-porous, and had breakfast and lunch with children who lived on the other side of the border who grew up with the notion that we were their enemies and to sort of befriend them and laugh with them and play with them. And I know it's cliched and it may be schmaltzy, but we really were a family. And when they had to go back home, there was a deep sadness that in the few days leading up to their expected departure. So the whole aspect, the whole interaction with the Syrians was something very, very uplifting almost at a spiritual level, and I'm not a spiritual person. Was it important? I think Eyal left you with the notion that, you know, the seeds have been planted in the minds of so many people about what we've done. I, I'm not uh, naive, and in my heart of hearts, I think it will probably make no difference, but I nonetheless think that it doesn't really matter. I think 
it was important for several thousand Syrians and it's a drop in the ocean when there were 1.7 million of them injured. But it was uh, more important for us, I think, to be able to do something was for us very, very important because until we did something in March and February 2013, it was very, very hard to sit on your hands with impotence and have a war raging around you. And as I said, there was something exhilarating, uplifting and a great relief when we were finally given the privilege of being able to do something. And I can only hope that the is right. I'll leave you there. Thank you. Hi, uh, Dr. Harari, thank you. Thank you so much. It was, uh, you know, I've, I've heard, I have heard the story, not, not with so many details and not with so many people around. And it, it is always amazing. So thank you. Thank you again for taking the time and talking to us. And thank you for all you did for the Syrian children and other children and everything you do as a, as, as a doctor, as a physician um, for all who need it. So thank you again. And uh, let's, uh, we, we have uh, a few questions on the chat. I'm, I'm not sure whether these questions should be answered by uh, Dr. Harari or maybe Yal or maybe both. Um, so let's, uh, let's see. Okay. Um, uh, so Harry wrote, I had heard of Syrians being treated in Israel by mainstream media. Perhaps more people need to be aware of this via the media. Okay, well, that's actually not a question, sorry. Um, Laura wrote, uh, this brings tears to my eyes, but it's also amazing to hear how these Syrian children will help. So thank you, sure, on behalf of all of us. And then Ina asked, uh, who gets uh, to Israel? Who chose inside Syria? And what happened when they get back? Eyal should so, probably answer who chose them. Okay. Uh, Eyal, would you please? So, so it was a mechanical coordination between us uh, to the Syrians. Um, we knew exactly who is going to uh, enter Israel. Uh, when, we're, when I'm saying we knew exactly, it means that we didn't know uh, the name or uh, it doesn't matter the name or the ID, we know what kind of injuries uh, we, we will be meeting on a fence. Uh, on the project of the children, it was uh, a couple of days work between Dr. Sergei and his colleagues uh, to see exactly what kind of illnesses we are going to get in a specific week in order that we will be able to coordinate it with the hospital. Uh, so we had our contacts inside. It began from one and two contacts and become uh, larger to over than 20. Uh, and we coordinate with them all kinds of activities. Of course, we had our red lines uh, there was uh, children that we couldn't uh, accept to Israel, uh, that their condition uh, won't be able to be treated in Israel. Uh, and again, those were our decisions, but we had a net of uh, people who spoke with them. Now, regarding to what happened then when they came back, nothing happened to them. They entered Israel after getting a permission from, in Arabic, we call it the fatwa. This is the meaning of uh, their uh, Islamic court of law decision, uh, which is even stronger than, uh, than, our, than uh, our Supreme Court decisions. And it allows them to enter Israel for life-saving treatment. So when they came back to Syria, Nobody in the green area 
blame them that they are Israeli spies. Of course, the, the regime didn't like it and the regime threatened them, but they were too weak in order to uh, hit them, those uh, people. So this is why all of them entered Israel uh, and were continuing day after day to, to cross the border to Israel. I might just interrupt uh, Juliano and, and just add something to Eyal and Sergei's credit. Um, uh, I was really honored to be asked to look after the Inziv Hospital receiving or doing a triage on the children who came to us electively, as it were, on buses, non-wounded children with chronic illness. And initially, we had not much idea who was coming and what was wrong with them. But over the two years of that part of the project, it became more and more sophisticated, meaning we knew the names, names don't matter, we knew the ages, what was wrong with the child. I would get a list from Sergei the day before and arrange for different subspecialties to be available if they had some, this wrong with them or that wrong with them. Um, most of the stuff was able to be dealt with by generalists such as myself, but the level of sophistication of the contacts between on the Israeli military side with the other side of the border must have been very, very good over several years for us to get that sort of information in advance of the children arriving. Uh, it was very impressive, I think, what Eyal and Sergei were able to, how they were able to prepare us to receive those chronically ill children. Yes, I must explain that the preparations were pretty hard because uh, it was uh, really, really problematic to conversate with the with the Syrian side because the Yal don't understand anything in a in a medicine, and I don't understand anything in Arabian language. So to <laughs> to compose all of this part, it was a pretty hard work. Uh, and the, a lot of the time I talk with the Syrian guys by, by Russian because some of the Syrian doctors will learn in Russian in, in the past. So this was a language to the conversation between the both sides of the border. Some of the anecdotes in this situation. Well, this is really amazing. I mean, it is always helpful to know another language, but uh, knowing Russian in order to uh, talk to Syrians, this is amazing. I actually talked to quite a few Jordanians uh, in Russian while I was traveling in Jordan, exactly for the same reason. Um, well, well, okay. I, I will just, Julia, I will just mention to Sergey because uh, it was so funny. In one of the nights we were in Israel with two of the most professional doctors, uh, the Syrian doctors. And we were coming back after a very, very long day uh, on Israel, on the, one of the hospitals, and we came back to the border. And while we were waiting on the border to, uh, that the forces will locate it and we will get the permission to go down the fence, it sometimes took between an hour to two hours until they cleared the area and gave us the opportunity to move forward the border. Uh, the, the Syrian doctor got a phone call from inside from one of their doctors. Now, when we're speaking about doctors, some of them were doctors like I am a doctor and basically uh, I know nothing about uh, helping people so, but they learned a year in the university, the war started and they became doctors. So one of those doctors phoned his colleague, which was expert and told him that it was something emergency. And he started and he opened the, the, the stomach of this wounded guy because he was bleeding, but now he's stuck, he don't know what to do. And it was amazing to see this guy speaking, it was, scenario that two Syrian doctors, two Israeli officers, one of the Syrians speaking Russians with the Israeli doctor, with Dr. Sergei, then they are translating each other to Arabic and we are coordinating in Arabic. So it was a multiple languages. It was Hebrew, it was Russian, it was Arabic. It was a great scenario and uh, how we communicate uh, and 
uh, eventually they started they succeeded to save his own life but it was very complicated this uh, engagements because of the, the difference in the languages but it was uh, I, I think we succeeded to do it well well this is uh, this is quite a story and thank you for sharing again it is amazing how easy it is to uh, to wound and to kill a person and how difficult it is and how many efforts it takes uh, to heal the person. Um, there is a question by David to Eyal. Um, how many militarians attempted to sneak into Israel and were any caught trying to hurt Israelis? So as mentioned before, um, when we were on the uh, going defense, we were, uh, we were worried from the enemy trying to shoot on us and to launch missiles or bombs. Uh, nobody sneaks or nobody tries to attack. Uh, we knew that it might happen. I can tell you as a commander, as a field commander, that sending your soldiers, the border fence, knowing that today it might happen, it make you a huge stomach. Uh, it's a huge responsibility on your shoulders and it's really disturbing your nights. Uh, not every time, not every night I could, I could have been with my soldiers on the fence. And as a commander, it's so difficult. Uh, fortunately, nothing happened. So nobody tried to sneak. Uh, but again, it doesn't matter because Every time, every night, every brief we did was uh, like, tonight is going to happen. So be ready. And uh, I, I can, cannot even share with people who, um, I, I think that just Dr. Sergei, who was also a field commander, can share and understand the feeling that you're sending your soldiers and you don't know whether you will meet their parents the day after. Uh, say them the, the baddest uh, uh, information you can you can get, and I, I, until they are not coming back to the base, uh, you cannot go to sleep, even if the operation ended. Uh, so fortunately, nothing happened. Nobody tried to sneak. Nobody tried to take advantage of the, on the situation. But uh, it doesn't matter. It could have been happened easily every time that we uh, went defense. Yeah. Well, um, this is, uh, it is amazing how huge responsibility you had and how much uh, careful you were and uh, how much you cared about the Syrians and the soldiers alike. Um, yeah, thank you for all that. We have, uh, let's see if we have more on the chat. Mm, okay, well, Pamela wrote, um, okay, well, you, you can probably just read it for yourself, but I will be uh, reading for everybody to Eyal, Michael, and Sergei. I'm so proud to be an Israeli originally from Chicago. This is Pamela, living here in Israel, knowing that the three of you and so many others like you have done such worthwhile work with so many people on behalf of our little country. Thank you. Yeah, yes, I just, uh, I, I just with no, your permission, you. with your permission, I want to uh, say something because I saw two people in the chat talk about uh, this, that the fact that this is not being published or why we, Israel is not uh, speaking about this uh, uh, operation. And I just can say that, um, and it is maybe even sharper in the, these days of uh, after the Guardian of the Walls that uh, the, the walls of that a lot of people from so many countries, including the U.S., are against Israel to share these stories. Uh, we cannot heal the problems of the state of Israel about the Asbara, about publishing those kinds of stories. I can tell you that the IDF has its missions on Golan Heights uh, and is now concerned from the Iranian and Hezbollah and he doesn't uh, have the time to speak about an operation that came to an end 
three years ago. But what I think and uh, the reason that I was uh, easily agreed to speak with uh, you is exactly because of this question. I decided that uh, I will not uh, give the, the, the word to forget uh, from this uh, operation. I know that also Dr. Michael, every time I ask him or Dr. Sergei to join a conversation, they are continuing sharing. And my request, and I think that Dr. Sergei and Dr. Michael will agree with me, that the only way that this story will be published is if you and we had almost 90 people on this session, if any one of you, every one of you will share this story with one or two of his closest people, it means that we will have 200, 300 people who will hear the story. I'm speaking about it daily on, on, on Twitter, on Facebook. So again, th this is how, this is the only way to continue sharing this story. It is not enough. It is not enough, of course but this is what we can do. And I will be very grateful if you will be able to continue and sharing the message of the Operation Good Neighbor. Um, thank you. Uh, Eyal, I, have uh, a, I'm I, have a, I have a converse twist to Eyal's because I, because I speak English and French, I was interviewed in over the five years on so many occasions, I think, at least twice a week, if not more, for, oh. uh, for five years, and to CNN and to Le Monde and to the Times of London and this and to the Australian Broadcasting Corporation. And the story is such an extraordinary story, and I was also puzzled by how little um, traction it seems to have had. And I think I eventually came to the conclusion that people actually don't want to listen to this story because I think it's another example of a deep-seated but camouflaged prejudice against us because this is an extraordinary story. I mean, I don't I think Eyal started his talk by saying in the history of human conflict, there hasn't been a country that treated people dedicated to its destruction in such a kind um, or humane way, and yet the story really never gave traction, just gained traction, despite the fact that we talked about it often in, in many different parts of the world. Uh, I, I don't think it's a question of us not publicizing it well enough. I think it has to be at least an element of people not really wanting to hear the conclusion because it doesn't fit with their predetermined ideas of us. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I think we are all uh, moved and impressed and, and uh, grateful and proud and uh, I don't know, some, some other words which you can probably use. Uh, I would like to thank again um, so much uh, Eyal for uh, your willingness to join us and uh, Michael, as always, I, uh, I have so much to thank you for. And uh, Dr. Kutiko Sergei, спасибо uh, большое. And um, thank you all, guys. Thank you all for coming, and Steve and Ilana, and uh, everybody. And let's uh, let's be proud, and let's let's do good. So um, the day after tomorrow, there is no presentation, as Steve mentioned. So I would just want to remind you that this is it. Uh, no presentation. Uh, this Thursday and um, and then in a week Tuesday there will be uh, a very interesting presentation I really hope that I personally will be able to join it from Seychelles Island uh, a presentation by uh, Hannah Rosenberg uh, she is a um, well she is she was born in America she is an Israeli now she uh, made Aliyah as a lone soldier she joined a combat unit and she is still there as a reserve combat fighter. And she will uh, share her perspective and her experience and her personal story as a uh, combat unit fighter uh, during the uh, Guardian of the Walls uh, operation. She also lives in Jerusalem and she was witnessing some of uh, the uprisals, some of the uh, difficult, okay, I will use this word difficult event, which took place in Jerusalem during the last uh, few weeks. So this is next presentation by uh, Hannah Rosenberg.
And then next Thursday, I will be telling you about Seychelles, which is expected to be a paradise on Earth. All right, that's all I have to say. And um, thank you again. Schmooz um, time. And I will fix my computer. <laughs> well, thank you very much for this uh, eye opener. Uh, I just wonder if somebody is writing a book that can be turned into a screenplay. I think you've got solid material here. Uh, but also, we need to uh, provide some advice to Julia on our honeymoon. I know that uh, it's been a while, and uh, so we need to, I don't know, what can people tell her? <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> you can figure it out, herself, Steve. Ah, okay, okay. Well, thank you very much for joining us. And Lila Tov, to those who are tuning out, the rest of us will remain for schmooze time. Everybody's welcome to stay. And we will just uh, have a conversation among us. And, uh, and thanks so much to everybody for joining us today. Shopping on have Thursday. Time, you need to Julia. buy something good. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Thank you for your kind words, uh, Mark. Thank you.